Before the Burnout series became one of the most intense, destructive arcade racing franchises of all time, we need to go back to 1993, when the fourth generation of gaming had just hit its prime, and gaming companies were already thinking about the future, the third dimension. Although some had already tried to integrate 3D technology into their existing consoles to give themselves a head start, an experience for the future including Star Fox, Virtual Racing, Virtual Fighter, and Doom to an extent. One one company was thinking more long term, and that was Canon, who were mostly known for their cameras. But they didn't want to be the next Philips or Laserdisc, not come across as an interactive side division, but also focus on making games fun to play as well. Through their European research lab, they created Criterion Software Limited, led by Fiona Sperry and Alex Ward, mostly fans of video games, and for the first few years, they created something that would shape an entire generation. Seriously, the the Renderware game engine basically powered not the 5th generation, but the 6th generation including Mortal Kombat, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, Persona, and anything made by Rockstar Games. A very important engine indeed. However, back then, they had to make good games to make the best of it. They skipped Microsoft DOS, making a few games for Windows including Scorch Planet, Subculture, and Redline Racer. But as the 6th generation was looming, they entered the console market to see if their engine is as ahead of its time as they were hoping. One of those games was called Shiny Red Car that wasn't going to be shiny for too long. Renamed Driving Hero before finally coming up with Burnout. Originally a PlayStation 2 exclusive inspired by movie's best car chases, one of the main selling points were the real-time crashes and the brief aftermath. It took them 18 months to develop, and when it was shown at E3 2001, along with other renderware powered games, it was voted the best racer by the PlayStation magazine. Considering that Gran Turismo 3 was already out at the time, fair enough. Burnout was released for the PlayStation 2 on November 2001, and for the GameCube and Xbox between March and May 2002. We're looking at the Xbox version being played on the 360. As a kid, I've always wondered why Burnout games were rated M15+, Australia's version of team, because it was a racing game set on a public road like Need for Speed, but they were rated G, Australia's version of everyone, which meant I wasn't allowed to play these games as a kid, and for some reason never gained interest to play any of them. Shocking, right? I think the only memory I have was back in 2006 when I went to a special Xbox 360 pre-release party of some sort, a month before the system's release in Australia. I was still in primary school at the time, so it's a bit vague. I remember feeling very lucky to be invited, and Burnout Revenge was one of the games on display. And even then, I don't know if it was a trailer or actual gameplay. My point is that I never grew up with it, and I had Need for Speed, Gran Turismo, and Crash Team Racing to keep my racing game desires full. But thanks to Patreon and probably a lot of you who like watching these reviews, racing games are popular here, the time has finally come. As is with video game franchises on this channel, I'm starting with the first one having never played any of the others. So keep that in mind if I become highly critical of this game. Three, two, one. Graphically, with the renderware engine still young, basic is the easiest way to describe the look of this game. It's not as graphically superior or fast-paced compared to what the series would eventually become. It feels more like the first two Midtown Madness games with more detailed accidents, which I'll get to. And playing this with the Xbox 360, while it's good to have a widescreen running in 60 frames per second, the aspect ratio is 16 by 10. Most of the cars sound like they're electrical. The loading times are long, especially for what this game has in terms of variety, and occasionally there's a glitch where it loops the same sound effect the entire game. and you can't even turn it down in the audio settings unless you mute the TV. Most of these issues are thanks to the 360 emulation, so take it with a grain of salt. But don't be surprised if I mute most of the footage in this review. This isn't the fiery, blistering presentation we're accustomed to in the Burnout series, but if Project Gotham Racing and Gran Turismo from that time period has proven, it should never be a drawback. Or should it?
This game has six championships to compete in, either a three race series or a giant one race marathon which takes 10 to 15 minutes to complete. And instead of using a point system like any typical racing championship, it uses a credit slash life system. Going back to the 16 bit racing days, games like F-Zero and Super Mario Kart on the Super Nintendo where you have to place a certain position to advance through the championship, regardless of whether you're first place or not. And as for the scores, they're just scores. Whether whether it's the fastest lap, race, and best driver based on how often you crash. How arcade is that? So all you're doing in this game is racing and trying to reach the required position to advance. That's it. There are other game modes like Face Off, Survival, and Free Run, but they're basically the same thing with either one car or no traffic. I won't say too much about the game modes because the rest of the series would introduce new ones as time goes by to capitalize on the physics. But even by 2001 standards, and if you get this game cheap today, I doubt you'll get what you pay for, because the simplicity is everywhere in this game. There are only four unlicensed cars with four colors to choose from, and six championship events. Not much here. Yes, the face-offs allow you to win other vehicle types which add up to nine, but why would you want to race with a tow truck or bus? I know you're less likely to crash, but because they're slower and harder to catch up to the leader, what's the point? And even though it took me just over three hours to complete all the championship races, four and a half if you include the secret game modes, which isn't very long for a racing game. The races go on for far too long. They were clearly trying to emulate the gameplay from the older Need for Speed games at that time. Giant tracks with a lot of laps. But in Burnout, you only have two maps with three tracks each. By that I mean two and then they connect together for the marathon. And in order to increase the gameplay time, you race them in reverse as well. The developers claimed before release that there would be 16 tracks, and the manual says it has 14. They must have intended to include more than two maps, but that's not what we got. Content wise, this game is like Project Gotham Racing, but with four cars not that much different from each other, one map with less tracks, and includes the challenges one-on-one, -on -one, street race with traffic, and street race without traffic only. I think Burnout is being very arcade-like in the wrong areas. <laughs> But hey, maybe it controls well enough to make you want to play it more than once, right? As I said before, growing up as a kid, having never played any of the Burnout games, but knowing the term Burnout, I always thought it meant the wheels kept spinning the entire race, currently made more obvious by the sound glitch, which made it harder to keep yourself on the track, encouraging crashes which were the best part. I mean, this is my pre-teen thoughts talking, but playing it today for the first time, it's true to some extent. The definitions of Burnout can be when you feel overworked, mentally and physically, and when a car spins its wheels while stationary to generate tire smoke. In this game, it combines those definitions together with its boost system which increases your speed. The way you fill it up reminds me of Need for Speed Underground 2. You need to either drive dangerously, cleanly, or both, practically filling up the bar instantly if you complete the full lap without making contact, and sometimes holding the boost right to the end immediately gives you another, hence the term burnout. It took me a long time to realize it, and used it a lot in the final couple of championships. I recommend driving on the wrong side of the road whenever on a long freeway. There isn't much sense of speed in this game, so the burners are the only way to provide that. Just note that it only works when you fill it up to the brim, and it quickly drains even if you're not using it, so it can't be used to get out of a slow situation. Oh god, I had to deal with this sound glitch almost the entire game. It's funny how you automatically indicate whenever you exit a freeway or turn on an intersection. I don't think it's going to matter that much if you're swerving past traffic on the wrong side of the road. Nice little detail nonetheless. Despite the lack of variety, I like the track design. In a way that you can slightly cut the corners a bit, which takes some track memorization and getting used to the slippery steering. The mechanics feel like a minor combination of Daytona USA and Cruisin' USA. Whenever you corner, there's a point when the car slides, but it's not as easy to control as it looks. You might notice that I run into a lot of barriers on the first hour of gameplay, and the car likes to stick onto the road like glue. They don't seem to gain any air. 
It's pretty bizarre. Very simple, but you don't feel like you have as much control of your car compared to rival races in 2001. I'm not a fan, honestly, but it is something you'll get the hang of when you reach the final couple of championships. Maybe it's because of the version I'm playing because I've read that some people think the PS2 and GameCube versions have better controls. But still, I wouldn't be surprised if they deliberately made them slippery just to increase the chances of having an accident. With its arcade-style checkpoint system and crashing becoming a selling point, it's plausible. Back in 2001, racing games, 3D ones at least, didn't have this much traffic at once. Not even Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2. Midnight Club Street Racing and Midtown Madness are the only 3D games preceding Burnout with decent levels of traffic at once that come to mind. So it's impressive for its time. And I think we all know why they're here. The crashes are easily the most exciting part of this game, even if you're supposed to avoid it as much as possible. No need to say too much. You already had racing games with damage models, but not that many where the spectacles themselves stood out. And whenever you complete a race, the only replays you can view and save are the crashes where you can change the speed and camera angle. You'd be surprised how easy it is to be hooked by it. Like a police chase TV show. However, at the same time, you are in a race where you only have either a few chances and a couple where they take ages to complete. So if you want to get anywhere, you need to avoid accidents as much as possible. I remember hating the traffic in the Need for Speed games in the early to mid 2000s. They always appear at the last second and occasionally ruin your entire race. But because Burnout is set during the day, it's a little bit easier to avoid them despite the slippery controls, at least whenever you're driving on the right side of the road. However, unlike Need for Speed, if you crash, it takes around 5 seconds to get back on the road because you need to wait for the crash to end. And this is why they're just as frustrating as they are exciting. Cars are so sensitive that even a a single nudge can cause the whole town to be held up. They also slightly recognize you and swerve a little bit, and that can tick you off sometimes. You're weaving through the traffic about to win, one second later a car flinches and that's the end of that. See? Even that's classified as a crash even though it looks like nothing. But because it was a bus and it blocked the opponent's path, I was able to keep the lead. Yeah, sometimes if you're lucky, the opponent behind can get caught in the accident, and they have to wait just as long to respawn onto the track. So, theoretically, crashes are a good way to keep the opponents at bay, but only if the roads are thin. However, this could be the reason why this game uses a rubber banding AI system, which like a lot of racing games, completely ruin everything. Remember the burnout system? using it non-stop on the wrong side of the freeway, well, the opponents are still right behind you. If all you need to do is not make any mistakes the whole race to win, then what's the point? It obviously makes you go faster, but one mistake on the final stretch, no matter how flawless your driving was the whole race, you lose. And it's not like you can use the burnout to quickly get out of a bad situation because, again, it's gone if you crash. just hit into some traffic. You might notice that I look behind a lot because it increases the chances of the opponent to crash themselves. Not only that, but it butchers the difficulty curve, like there isn't one. The closest you ever get to it is when the levels reverse and most of the roads are one way. Therefore, the ones in reverse are when the traffic is coming at you, so you're more likely to have an accident. That's about it. And this brings me back to the lack of variety. Car stats barely make a difference. Don't be fooled by that. You can complete all the championships using the same one, and because you're racing on only two different locations, everything feels the same the entire game. And when you combine it with the risk of having do the entire championship again because you don't get unlimited continues, it instantly sucks the life out of you doing it again because these races go on for a long time, although the chances of you doing that are about as slim as running out of time in a race. And even with that said, it takes around 3 hours to beat anyway.
Burnout is a game that feels like it was originally meant to be released exclusively for the arcade, but they changed their minds late into development. I mean, it is the first in the series, and the developers didn't know what to expect at the time. There are moments that are exciting, like the crashes, and the soundtrack isn't too bad either. You can see and feel the parts that would turn the series into the stuff of legends. It's just the annoying parts overshadow it too much, like the rubber banding and lack of content. Overall, it's just a short, boring racer that didn't stand out as much as its rivals in 2001. Not terrible, but not brilliant either. And I would avoid this one and go straight to any of the sequels, which I hope to review in the future.